Hello and welcome to Currency Exchange, NatWest Markets Podcast with Marcel, Imre Daly, and our team of FX strategists. Help to break down the major themes and events driving currency markets this week and for the weeks ahead. Um, today, I am joined by our two co heads of G10 FX Strategy, Brian Dangerfield, who is based over in the US, and Paul Robson, who is based here with me in London. This week, we had a raft of developed market central banks who were forced to make a decision whether to continue hiking rates uh, to press down against inflation or to consider uh, increased concerns over financial stability risk. Um, I will start in chronological order. Um, I guess the first one up this week was definitely the Fed. We had kind of whipsaw in terms of market expectations for how much they were going to hike by. Um, Brian, in the end, what, how much did they hike by and what was the impact for the dollar? Thanks very much, Emer. So the Fed did opt to hike the policy rate by 25 basis points. Now, we had been expecting going into the meeting that the Fed might consider a pause given the financial stability risks not only in the immediate term, but in the more medium term as well, that you think about what the tightening in financial conditions seen since the onset of financial market stress has meant for the US economy, it could mean tighter credit standards. It could mean lower business and consumer confidence um, down the line. These are all things that are potentially negative for growth and disinflationary. So we thought that this could potentially merit a pause this week. And while the Fed decided to hike the policy rate by 25 basis points, The FOMC nevertheless checked a lot of the dovish boxes that we were expecting going into the meeting. If anything, I think the the hike itself was probably the one thing that you could call hawkish in the entirety of their communication. There were a lot of references that we were expecting that would, you know, sort of come alongside an interest rate pause. The specific discussion I mentioned a second ago about how tightening in financial conditions that we have seen uh, could lead to lower growth and disinflationary pressure increasing down the road. That was something that Powell made extremely clear uh, in his press conference and in the FOMC statement. Additionally, the statement language guided very clearly towards a potentially slower pace of tightening from here, if at all. So you compare in the prior meeting in February, the Fed said that ongoing increases in the Fed funds rate will be appropriate. That was a very clear signal that they thought that heights were going to be needed, certainly delivered a hike at their meeting in March. But they changed that guidance to say that some additional tightening may be needed. That change from will to may introduces that condition and introduces that risk that the Fed tightening cycle uh, may be closer to an end uh, than they thought it was just a few weeks ago. Additionally, the Fed released its summary of economic projections, which includes what we call the dot plot, which is the assessment of individual members' views on where the federal funds rate will be at certain intervals, usually the end of the year. Um, and the 2023 dot median, the median projection of FOMC members for where the policy rate will be at the end of the year, that was left unchanged relative to December. And if you think back just a few weeks ago, that feels like a very significant change because we know the data coming into this decision were generally very strong. And the Fed just a few weeks ago had told us that the median was likely to be higher. Instead, it was left unchanged with the median uh, expectation just 25 basis points above where the policy rate is as of the decision yesterday. So there was a lot of dovish qualifications, a lot of changes in the way the FOMC is talking, which lean into our expectations, even though we didn't get the pause that we were expecting. And it's very clear now that the possibility of you know reaching the end of the tightening cycle, uh, that possibility feels like it's a lot closer now than it was uh, just a few weeks ago. The change in financial conditions has been significant Uh, a driver on that front. Yeah, I think it's really interesting what you're saying, but, you know, we've had really strong U.S. data. And yes, that media dot pop wasn't revised higher. I know you spoke before about how the market's emphasis had switched away from data dependency to concerns about financial stability. I mean, given what we saw from the Fed, are we going to switch back? Are we going to read data watching again? Or do you think it's more all-encompassing? I think that's an important risk to flag here is that when financial market stress was as sort of at its peak, I think it's you know it's probably too early to say that we're through the worst of the financial market stress, but certainly markets are trying to price towards a brighter days ahead. I think it's fair to say. Um, but I think probably the risk here is that when market stress is extremely high, then the data take on a little bit less importance in terms of the outlook for 
uh, in terms of the near-term outlook for the Fed. But if we continue to see some pricing out of financial stability concerns, that could re-put some of the pressure on economic data upcoming. And so that's going to be really important as we get into early April, I believe, as we see you know the next non-farm payroll, the next CPI, um, whether the Fed's you know, a lot of the Fed language was very conditional on they expect the tightening in financial conditions to have feed through into credit conditions, into growth and business conf- and business and consumer confidence. Um, is that something that shows up in the data immediately that we're going to get just coming up in a couple of weeks? It's probably too early to say. Um, as you know, those who listen to this podcast frequently will know, we've been generally seeing the data acceleration in early 2023 that we've seen so far with a bit of a skeptical eye thinking that the weather and turn of the year seasonals, moderate winter weather, I should say, uh, may be boosting some of that. So we were already pretty open to this idea that data coming into the spring was likely going to moderate a bit, that the reality was the US economy was probably not accelerating in the way that the data may have suggested that it was uh, early in the year. Now, I feel like when you layer on top the risks around financial stability, and the concerns about tightening conditions and lower business and consumer confidence, that risk feels a bit more potent to me. I think the question would be how the market tries to assign those medium-term risks against the near-term data. If we don't see any of that, um, if we don't see any meaningful slowdown in that data, I think it could still be possible that the market has to, you know, maybe the Fed could deliver an additional hike, for example. But it certainly feels like from the dollar perspective, We've moved away from this constant, ever more hawkish Fed reprice. Certainly feels like the Fed's pivot towards a potential pause uh, at some point soon. It feels like it's maybe a lot more credible at this point, given the changes in financial conditions that we've seen. And that's a big departure uh, in the way that we should be thinking about the dollar, that the dollar risks to the upside, I think, are clipped here by the fact that the Fed, the ceiling on Fed repricing has come down and uh, perhaps substantially. And so, you know, we've been negative on the dollar, bearish on the dollar, you know, certainly data dependent like like everyone else, but we think that the tightening in financial conditions and what that's meant for the Fed on top of the risk for the dollar that we saw from shifting relative growth uh, expectations uh, continue to point towards a weaker dollar outlook. I know the market has been you know, really waiting for that Fed to much pivot. So maybe finally we have it and, and tiny financial conditions and it helps the Fed get there in the end. Um, well, Europe certainly did not disappoint when it came to central bank meetings. I have to bring in Will Robson. And um, obviously we had ECB last week and there was concerns, very high concerns within the Eurozone over kind of financial stability. This seems to have stabilized this week. I mean, how does it change your outlook for your dollar going forward? Oh, it doesn't um, change it uh, dramatically. What it does do, though, is it um, increases our confidence, for example, that euro dollar ultimately just moves higher through the year. We've always had this target of 115 for euro dollar and the events that, that you've um, set out and also the events that um, uh, Brian has set out very much supports that, that view. Uh, I think for the euro, the key takeaway is the sort of dust settles on that financial market instability that you you mentioned. I, I think the key takeaway is going to be about lending and credit and how it's impacted differently both sides of the Atlantic. Now, it feels like the the main hit to the credit impulse in the economy is going to be more in the US than it is in Europe. And, and that's important for the euro dollar outlook because it's a function of both uh, where interest rates go on both sides of the the Atlantic, but also growth expectations in the US relative to the rest of the world. So whatever you think the implications are over the last couple of weeks, sort of financial market angst, it's going to lead to weaker credit growth. The velocity of money through the economy is going to be weaker in the US, other things being equal uh, to the rest of the, the world. So it, uh, we think the main takeaway from this week um, events is uh, euro dollar uh, increased confidence that it, it, it moves high. And you've always been bullish on sterling, and I feel like this week did not disappoint. We got Bank of England; uh, they hiked in line with expectations, but I think the initial market reaction was definitely sterling higher. Uh, does it reinforce your bullish uh, cable view? 
And to be honest, um, there was very much, there's sort of very little in the, the Bank of England decision uh, this week. We think it's actually not a monetary policy story for Sterling, but um, a list of these sort of dogs that haven't barked in terms of uh, the outlook. But in terms of that decision itself, uh, we did get that 25 basis point high, which was largely priced after we had some stronger than expected uh, inflation numbers earlier in the week. But it was a it was a dovish hike, and the dovishness around it really came in the, the minutes and the guidance where the MPC seemed more confident than they were previously that inflation comes down uh, back up uh, down to target. And, and they talk about the need to raise rates only if they see evidence of more persistent inflation pressures. And within that, they're focusing on wage growth, and they reference a weaker than expected uh, wage growth. So they, they feel more confident in that and our economic team are also uh, more confident they don't see a further um hike in rates in this cycle although they do say that you know what's the greater risk a, a cut in rates or another 25 basis points while well, the risks are still skewed uh, to higher rates but really it's that dovish guidance that um source selling actually give back some of those early gains that you you referenced uh, but we do think that um sterling isn't really a monetary policy story because even on inflation and monetary policy tightening it's never clear how that plays for the currency because if we have a quicker than expected rise in interest rates on inflationary pressures and people just worry about growth expectations and even more in the uk weaker growth which is important in the um, context of a current account deficit that needs to be funded stronger growth in the uk attracts capital weaker growth uh, means that the uk is less uh, attractive uh, but when we think about the other things that people have uh, worried about in terms of the UK, I call them the sort of dogs that haven't barked. I mean, I sometimes talk about a cat that doesn't meow because I know that some of the listeners uh, um, on the call will be uh, cat lovers more than dogs. So I have to be careful not to discriminate against dogs. But um, in terms of the dogs that haven't barked, um, we still see a, a long list of them, whether it's um, over immigration, over housing market weakness, over uh, EU trade war, a whole long list which um, haven't really come through. Uh, and we still think the risk premium in the currency is far too large. Uh, and I think over the next six months, that will gradually get squeezed as people see that the economy is being a little bit more resilient than expected. We're seeing that in growth forecasts uh, and that sterling um, maps the rise in euro dollar that we have uh, in our uh, expectations. So maybe uh, sterling gets all the way up to 130 dollar. Uh, by the summer. I hope so. Basically, better for my sterling savings and, and my holiday options. Well, in contrast to the Bank of England delivering, you know, a dumbish hike, I guess the opposite side of that is the Norges Bank that, you know, hiked 25 basis points, but we're really signaling uh, that they would go again at their next meeting. Do you think, you know, not to be oversold from current levels? Yeah, I, I think the Norwegian kroner is uh, too low and too cheap. I, I think it's very interesting to compare the UK with Norway, it, they, they fall in the same bracket of uh, households that are sensitive or exposed to floating rate interest rates. And again, when I mentioned the UK about interest rates going too high, people worry about growth. Now, Norway has the energy uh, buffer and that's kept the, the economy a little bit stronger, but uh, inflation has been higher than expected. Growth in the mainland economy has also been stronger than expected. And they also followed, interestingly, uh, the Ritz Bank to reference the currency in particular. So um, the idea that if inflation, uh, sorry, if the currency was to continue to weaken, they would have to raise their inflation forecast and potentially have to raise interest rates uh, more than the market expects. But the, the key um, guidance when the UK was, uh, and the Bank of England was slightly dovish, it was that rate path. And that's the main signaling for the Norges Bank. And that was raised by a whole 50 basis points, which when you think about where I mean, we think we're at the, the peak in the global tightening cycle is actually quite a lot. So uh, support for monetary policy, uh, valuation support, uh, Norwegian Kronen perhaps strengthening again through the, the summer. So to answer your question very directly, yeah, we think it's been oversold. If monetary policy divergence is still a massive driver on the back. So, Emer, can I jump back in and ask you about what you're thinking about emerging market currencies here? I mean, we seem to have 
Um, every day, it seems like we have a different ebb and flow around expectations, uh, around the evolution of financial market stress. But you also have this potentially significant change, at least certainly I think a significant change uh, in the Federal Reserve signaling, uh, which you know certainly has implications for emerging markets. So how are you thinking about emerging market, the landscape uh, at the moment? Yeah, I'm going to say I am cautiously optimistic. I do think you're right that, you know, at the uh, Federal Reserve, I look potentially kind of nearing that peak of their policy rates would dramatically change the landscape for EM. I think once you get kind of that peak at Fed rate uh, in, I think you do have people looking for opportunities for carry trade. Obviously, the big if is if we've got a return to lower vol environments. But then I do think, you know, we could see investors kind of edging back into local currency bonds and certainly EMFX was still, you know, offer a significant carry uh, to investors, even though valuations may be quite stretched at some levels. Um, I think the potential to earn carry, you know, is significant. We should really see um, a return. I guess the one thing I can say over the last few weeks is you know, we've had a complete shakeout of positions. We know where positions were most extended and were most vulnerable. And hopefully some of that positioning has been cleared back. So for me, I'm kind of lucky in my space at the Czech Corona, which I think does offer investors carry, but relatively uh, relative political stability within a quite volatile region. I think over in Latin M, it's probably, you know, the EM region, which really offers investors the most significant carry. So, you know, Max, Brazilian Real, still very attractive for investors. Up there, I would say, again, you know, if we get the return to um, a less volatile market environment. Well, guys, that is us for this week. And if you have liked the podcast, please do click like and remember to subscribe so you get the latest episodes as early. Thank you again.